starting into this, the uh, we were we uh, were asked to uh, go and do a bit of a presentation, and I thought rather than go back over apps and things like that, I find that there are a ton of things that you can do on your Amiga that that uh, make using the computer and getting things done a lot faster and more efficient. And there there are a lot of little things that I think that. You may well know, may, most people know a lot of these things, but you don't know a lot, of, uh, a few of them, and they do make life easier. I was finding out some of these just in the, um, just yesterday, I saw something new that Steve Solly did, and I thought, wow, that's just amazing. And it's a nice, fast way of getting things done. Apparently, it's something that came from, um, from the uh, Unix world, and Mega OS does it. Um, and, an example of these kind of things, I mean, everybody knows you can do screen dragging and, you know, that's a nice way to be able to get to things and, and uh, if, uh, if you're, um, find a good example, file to open, if you are using a uh, cross stock file system and the it's actually, you want to keep it on its own screen or look at it on its own screen. Obviously in uh, multi-view, you can go and say, use separate screen, but now you can't get to it. And obviously you can screen drag to get to it, but you can also drag your screen off to the side by holding the shift key. These are just little things that allow you to go and do things. And over here, you can have a text editor open and there's the screen that was behind. Um, I see that there you have the ability to get into all the different screens and get to the things behind and pull the screen to the front. So if you've got an application that runs on its own screen, you have the ability to use them almost like they're Windows. And each one of them is is uh, still a regular ordinary Amiga screen, and you can still move them to the back and the front with a screen gadget. You just use the shift key to do it. It's a nice, easy way to get get into applications and get through things that um, let you use your your machine. Um, again, this is a shift key. Um, Alex Carmona, fellow beta tester and um, uh, diehard Amiga user, has got a website with a lot of these things on it, and I'll give him some more of these that we're talking about, and I'll run through today. You guys will have a place that you can look at it, and we can we can post the URL. Um, the uh, um, another thing, which I thought is is kind of handy. Uh, how many everybody know about the different qualifiers and how you can use them? They're standard across Amiga OS in terms of how um, you move around. Uh, you most people know you could use a shift key, go to the beginning of the end of line. But you've also got the ability to go by words. And this works in anything, in a text shell, in a file requester, in the console. If you open up the console and you type something that's a bunch of words, you can use the shift key to go either end of that. You can use the alt key to go by words. You can use control is, is for highlighting, right? But you can use combinations of these things. So you can go and pick things out You can go and pick things out, if I have a real file name, but if I go to work, productivity, PCP, actually it's probably better to go to a real directory page stream, script, so I'm in an in a actual name. If I use the cursor key as alt key, it's jumping piece by piece. So it's like if I'm in this direct, in this path and I want to get part of it, hold the control key down. And actually, it's not working. The, um, you have the ability to go jump to a certain point of that and then you can go pick the, the dash and from here you can just delete. Again, shift key and you can delete to the beginning of the end of the line. So if I move to the middle of the word, if I hit shift delete, you're delete there. If I go to the shift return, it deletes the beginning of the line. 
simple stuff. I don't know if everybody knows these kind of tricks that they can work in combinations. Um, another one is you have the ability to, like for example, if I want to save this file, you have the ability to do all of these kind of things in this kind of a text field here. Again, Alt key jumps the cursor. You have the ability to go and say, let's say if the file had a number in it, let's say it's number 54, you can, oops, you can decrement and increase the, the number. You see it increasing just by doing, using command right amiga plus, right amiga minus, decrements it. Simple way, if you're dealing with a lot of numbered files, I do it when I'm dealing with image files. And you're dealing with a lot of image files, and you get to increment in the number, you don't have to go through there and type it, you just open it up and say, okay, I'm saving the next one, plus 13, 14, 15, 16. And you could just save the file out, automatically increment it. There are a bunch of these keyboard equivalents that work, specifically in the text gadget. Like the plus or the minus key, you got the ability to, the last key press, if I typed all this, I'm like, oh damn, I didn't really mean to do that. Amiga Z undoes it. Um, if you have, um, keep going through the whole thing. If you want to select the whole thing, Amiga A selects it all. This works in any text gadget. Like, if you know these things, there are real quick ways of getting through and getting anything done. And you can do it in any text, in any standard Amiga OS text gadget. You go into a file request, or you go into a program that brings up a prompt, you just do this, and you, you have a quick way to get through things. Um, everybody knows scroll lock is help. And we don't have help keys anymore on these lowly uh, PC keyboards anymore. Um, if you're on the workbench, you used to be able to hit the help key on the Amiga and get help. Well, you have scroll lock. And that's still maps to general application. So if you're in an application that uses that, I don't know why my screen is cut off on that side. Um, if you use the, uh, you have the help key and in, in an application that uses help, you've still got the ability to go and pull up the help, the standard help, just like we always had it. Um, another one, I find it an interesting and handy little thing. If you're in the workbench, um, and these are a bunch of just little hacks on the workbench. Let's say you have your computer and you're, um, you're, you don't want your kids playing with it, with files, getting into your work or something like that. You have the ability to go into workbench press and let's say, you know, your uh, data directory is where your valuable files are and your, your apps directory. You have the ability to go and say, test, they no longer appear in the workbench. They're still there. If you go into a text editor and you open up a text editor and you'd say volumes, they're still there in the file requester. Anybody who's a competent user will still find it. But if you've just got a six-year-old in there who's just plunking around on your computer, you could go in there and say, okay, that's it. You're not getting to anything. <laughs> anything but junk. That's it. That's the only directory you're getting, the only drop you're going to see. They, they have to have a little bit more insight, but at least here they're just going to get in the crap directory where everything's expendable. Again, just hiding devices. And you just save it. Or in this case, I just did test. Obviously, it's just sitting there. I could iconify it, leave that there. Come back. Tell it to restore, set, reset the last save. Everything's back where it was. Um, or obviously you can go and change all of this stuff. I'd say use and it's gone until the next reboot. Um, I, I would assume everybody knows that you always have to save and use in Amiga. You know? Even if you're a foreigner <laughs> from another computer. It's a wonderful concept. The ability to save and use. Something no other platform I have ever seen has that universally. Um, You've got the ability also, you know, look, you have the ability to go and set whatever gets printed in that title bar. And again, that's in workbench preferences. 
workbench preferences, there's your command line right there. And you could set these with a percentage sign variables that allow you to set whatever you want to have there. I have it set so it tells me how much free memory I have. You know, this, this little SAM has only got 64 megs of video RAM. It's really easy to run out. It's only got 512 megs of, of, of fast RAM. So I have it up there. I can tell when I'm using Odyssey and it's just sucking down RAM and it starts getting a little too low. I have it set up so that's always giving me a live feedback. One of the nice things is, and I don't have it set up here, but you can go and insert any one of these command codes. And you come over here and you can say, I want to put in an environment variable and put in something that could be, uh, you know, time or something. or, or uh, Anything that's in that area. Um, So I just inserted the ability to show that test. Assuming that whatever is. There's the home string. Yeah, there's the percent and right there. Come up there. You have the ability to call up a, a um, environment variable, and those environment variables can be anything. Somebody had asked me about putting in a. I isn't showing up. <laughs> you have the ability to go and set environment variables. Somebody asked about being able to show the time in your title bar. You could do this for weather. You could do this for anything, and you set that variable, and it shows up. Um, should show up. It's not showing up for some reason. easy to set. Um, we did a one line, um, it was a, a simple script that I had uploaded once that set the time into a variable and you could go and set the variable. You could set a script that goes and gets uh, current temperature and all of these different things. And I had a little bit more time I would have done that. But um, Another item is if you want to clean up your workbench the ability to hide your um, your uh, title bar. If you want to have a clean looking workbench, you still have the ability to go up to the top and see it at any time. It disappears. Um, another one is if you don't like the way your workbench looks and you want to clean it up and you want to uh, change the way it looks, I'm going to set this all back to visible again so I can find things. Then you had the ability to go and change the appearance. And on OS4 Depot, there are a whole variety of um, themes that you can set. If you want to have your change from the default theme, you have the ability to go in and change the appearance of your entire workbench. Obviously, something's still open. Huh? There's something still open. No. Something's still locking it. And they got. Well, easily enough. <laughs> So there are settings 
where basically anything you copy to the environments, to your uh, keyboard, Brian. <laughs> Um, does this do this all the time? Uh, was this the machine? Was this what you were using on the five thousand? Uh, okay. Because if it's sending like spurious characters in, that could be an issue. So you have the ability to go and change themes. And now it just changed the look of everything in the workbench, the gadgets. This is something that you can configure, but people have uploaded sets of themes to OS4 Depot. So you can go and change from one theme to another. If you don't like that one, you go to that one. Simple, completely different looking workbench. Um, if you really want to abuse yourself, you can go use that one. <laughs> See, it looks like you're using Windows. You could do this on your machine at work and everybody would think you're not using uh... <laughs> it's a radioactive landscape. <laughs> but to get rid of it, <laughs> it's easy to reboot. I just don't want that on there. <laughs> just contaminate the system. So these are all those. The um, it, it, yeah, obviously I could put my keyboard back in. No, no, that's this is my mouse. Um, so you have the ability to go and change all those settings, and there are a myriad of them in the GUI press and in fonts and all that. But what people did is they collected all those together and they made sets of them, and that the. Uh, what I've been uh, clicking on are basically a script that essentially just takes and copies the contents into an environment, um, says. And the system automatically recognizes it and loads up the settings and you just change your complete setup. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that if you wanted to set up a nighttime setup so it's not so bright a screen and a daytime setup, set up a different setting, put the files on your system, just a single line script, double click on it, you've gone to nighttime settings. Um, that uh, is something that you could go and stick in your dock. I just simply have an Amy dock, change your settings to nighttime, and you have a dark screen. Um, another thing which, which I, don't, I, I don't know how much people have messed with, you have the ability to set tools. We've always had the ability to set what the tool is um, for an application. Obviously, if you have you know, I just dragged a, wind, uh, a video that, that's here. By default, if it doesn't know what a tool is or how to use it, it always dumps it into multi-viewer. Multi-viewer is not going to be able to deal with it, obviously. The, now we have the ability to use what's called after. And what that does, like you see there, what that does is it lets you it automatically finds the path of the last time this application was run. So if you don't want to use that, you can go and change it to be DB player. You don't need to worry about the path. It's wherever the, the application is. You change it. Automatically runs. Um, And then you have, once you have that set, and if that's the application you want to use, you have the ability, because this is recognized by the system as being an AVI file, you have the ability of saying save as the default um, icon for this type. So from there on out, if you ever have an application that actually doesn't have an icon saved for it, and you're just looking at files, you know, anything that has an AVI file is automatically going to call up um, call up that application. We've set the default for it now. Um, anyway, again, that's... So normally, like this right here has an info file on it. So you, it's, it's defined, it's got the info file. And if you were to go in and delete the info file off of it,
Now it doesn't have an info file. It went to gray. Now, again, normally if you double click on a program without an info file, you would go into multi-viewer because that's the, the default thing. But we've saved it as a default icon for AVIs. And we've told it to make it after a DVI player. So it goes and finds wherever the last place you use DB player and automatically runs that copy. Anytime you run a program, automatically the path of that program is stored in after. So any tool, it's perfect for tools because if you're going to use DB player or multiviewer or Amiga amp or whatever, you just say after and the name of the tool, it all finds automatically the last place you ran it. So you have to run it once, but it's going to know where it is. You don't have to worry about setting the path and all that other stuff. If you take this file and you move it to another machine, it'll find the wherever the last one that was run on that machine. So if you hard code it to be a apps, a hard drive and a path location, you're screwed if you move the file. In this case, after finds it wherever it happens to be on any given system. So it gives you an easy way to make the thing, make, make files work and work anywhere. Uh, I'm not sure. I think 4.1, but I'm not certain. This, I mean, these are the kind of like little tweaks that just keep getting added in um, over time. And they sort of get added in and then you forget they were added. <laughs> they were, it seems like they've been there forever. And then you talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, you don't have that. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but it's in there and FE now. So, and, uh, so that makes for a nice handy way to get things done. Um, I think that um, setting up and creating a, a, a default icon for something um, is is a uh, is always a, a challenge. I mean, I've set up and created like um, for media streaming media files on the internet default icons for PLS files and M3U files. And you know, as it stands, if you go to a radio station, a website, and you go and click the listen button, it downloads to your machine a PLS file or an M3U file, and you can set up in your web browser to automatically get that file and play it. Easy enough, and but then every time you want to you listen to that radio station, you have to go back to that website and go click on that download link or listen button. But it's why bother to follow that? Just download the file to your machine, and then you get a file like this, which is just a PLS file and automatically brings up. Oops, it's like I got an old PLS file. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I have to re uh, set up that. You get a you get a file, and but you have to, you need to set up a default type for it. And the act of setting up the default type, I mean, you go into you have got def icons, and it's full of default types, tons of them. And in the case of like the PLS file. I can delete it and show you how, how it works. Essentially, you go in there and say you want to add a new file. You give it, oh, actually, one thing you should do is tell it to create icons. So you go in there, you say, I want to create a new, new type, in this case, PLS. So you have the type there. You need to tell it how to be recognized. So you can tell it by all sorts of different things. You can have it go and search for um, a, a binary a string within the file, everything. In this case, it's a PLS file. It can be done by just purely a pattern. So give it a pattern, PLS. You've given it how it's recognized, how, um, what kind of file it is. You need to set up an um, uh, icon for it. In this case, I just drew an icon in the, in the editor. Pretty, pretty crude. Uh, but it's just a PLS file. It looks, I know, right. <laughs> and you can then also go in and say, you set the information for it. So it's just like you open up Workbench information on the file. There's def PLS. You come over here, you set again, after, and a player. And from there, you've got a type all defined. It's all ready to go, and there it is with that ugly icon. Or, for example, 
you know, I've got a real radio, online radio stations, and there's a whole bunch of radio stations that are defined. And in all their cases, all you do is just double click on it. Oh, it is working. So, automatically you just double click on it, it's there. Um, there are even easier ways to do it, but people are always bemoaning in TuneNet, ah, oh, we lost our online radio streams because Shoutcast changed something in their URL and their, in their website, and all of a sudden it didn't scan it anymore. You could just go to that site or any individual radio station site or, um, or uh, a, a, a live 365 or all these other places that have got streaming MP3 file um, streams download the file, stick it in a directory. Um, you know, I have Fairfax County Police helicopter has got online radio. We were once sitting there in the middle of the night, there was a helicopter hovering overhead. I'm like, what the heck is that? And I go online, I found the stream. I'm like, dump it in there. I have got it there. I can go and listen to the, the and I'm there chasing a guy through our, you know, some drunk driver through our neighborhood, you know. And I'm um, listening to it on the radio as they're doing it. <laughs> oh yeah, it was amazing. And I'm sitting there listening to it in the middle of the night. Um, so, it's, and it's, once you set it up, and it's reasonably easy to set up, once you set it up, like I said, you have a very quick, easy way to go get to the, something as easy as radio streams, but any type of file you want to use. Um, and, and, uh, so that's another little trick to use. Um, I talked about the after. Uh, as I was saying, there, there's another way to even automate this beyond that. Um, you know, as you see here in, in Amy Doc, you know, I, I have an internet button, and there's the sub doc. Normally my screen auto scrolls off to the left, but, and I just have the directory. I just drag the directory with all the radio streams there. So anytime I want to get to the entire list of radio streams, I just pull that up and there it is. I don't have to go rummaging through the hard drives, I just pop up the menu and pull it. Could have been it could have been sitting right here. Or for example, I have my notes. There's a there's a standard document I keep in just general running notes in. And it's right there in your doc, you just drag the icon in there. The the same thing applies for for the you know, the radio station that I was just on or your WTOP news. Or you get to hear Washington, D.C. Uh, news. Uh, <laughs> again, I just took one of these icons right there and just dragged it into the dock. And, but the nice thing about Amy Dock is you have the ability to go and say, okay, you edit this and you go into there. For any item, you can go and say, for example, the shell. You can give it a keyboard equivalent. I'm a huge fan of keyboard equivalents. I can bring up any program. If I want to bring up a text editor, I do that. Shell, eyebrows, easy. It's like all of these things can be brought up very quickly. They don't, don't require any uh, messing around with the hard drive. Your clean system, simple dock. You just go and pull it up by a keyboard equivalent. Same with the radio stations. And if you, if you define it with all keys or MM keys, you can go and say, I want to make that button right there my radio station button. Hit the button, you have music. All of it's just by using F key or Amy Doc and defining key, key codes for it. Um, of course, all under your control, which is the nicest thing and the unique thing to the Amiga, that it's that easily accessible. Um, F key. I mean, this is a thing which I mentioned. I, I like the ability, again, the you know, keyboard person, this side of Solly and the shell. I like the ability to just close the window by just clicking on. And what I did was I defined a, um, so F key is a commodity there. And in there, I've one of the only thing I've got defined in there is that the escape key is the equivalent of clicking the close gadget. It's the equi equivalent to coming over here and hitting the close gadget. So I have this shell, if I come over there and do that, or just, but you can define a whole variety of escape sequence keys. Not only have close gadget, you can go and 
type in text, or run a program, run an AREC script, all of these different things, and define a whole slew of commands. And again, if you if you define use all keys or one of those programs, you can go and say, I want to start defining multimedia keys to do things. And you have ways of tying it in and, and remote controlling your computer however you want to. It makes it a little bit of a pain in the neck when you use somebody else's computer and you don't have all your shortcuts. But, <laughs> um, but that's what it's all about, is how do you optimize the computer because the machine serving you, not you serving the PC um, or Mac. Uh, so F keys, hugely valuable thing, um, and a nice uh, way to customize your computer. Um, the uh, I don't know how much um, people have uh, uh, understand that that uh, if you're in a in a uh, text editor or any program. And let's say you, you start looking for a file and you, you decide, okay, well, I got to, uh, I don't know if I have any files in there now. Oh, yeah. Obviously, we've got drag and drop, so you drop an icon there and you go to the AOS file and there's some stuff all in there. And let's say you want to get the ability to delete files and rename files right from within any, uh, your ASL file requester. You just hit rename and you just start editing the file name right there. Um, again, a nice handy way to be able to get something done without having to actually even leave the uh, uh, leave what you were in the process of doing. I didn't have to go out to a shell or go into the workbench or anything like that. Right in, I'm opening up a file and I see something I need to change or edit or change uh, whatever. Edit it right on the spot. Um, the uh, uh, another thing with the file with file requesters, you've got in preferences, you've got ASL preferences. You have the ability to find a few other things that are are, are um, shortcuts for getting around. Um, if you're in the file requester, I'm in uh, in this directory here. You have the ability to go and say, extra keys on your mouse can define going to the parent or going to the list of volumes. Just another shortcut. You could go down here and click these, or you could just hit the button on your mouse, your third button. In this case is the scroll wheel on the Amiga mouse. Or my trackball, I've got four buttons, and one of them is parent, and one of them is a very quick way to, again, navigate and get around and all that. Um, the uh, One thing which, like I said, I'm using a lot of keyboard equivalents, and you've got, I don't know how many people use the shell, and people stay away from this shell because it seems like it's slow and difficult to use and cumbersome, and it involves a lot of typing, and um, they don't want to deal with all of that. One of the things that your shell has, just like the user's startup sequence, you've got a shell startup script. The script gets executed every time you start your computer, your shell. Each time you start the shell, like when we were doing the video last night for the presentation, well, I didn't know who was going to be running the video and how hard or easy it was going to be. And the command line for running um, M player when you have a lot of uh, functions could be quite long. I mean, there's an example right there of how long the command line might be for running uh, M player and tweaking the settings. You certainly don't want to type that every time. So instead, you get the ability to create an alias. And I created an alias that just goes to a two-letter string. This is all of this stuff is automatically set up every time you open a shell. You type a shell. And I have a ton of these aliases. If I want to go and connect to my internet, there I'm connecting into I'm connected to my shell accounts in uh, Utah or wherever they are. Um, and that's just sitting there running in the shell. One, for, you, for those who don't know, I mean, the Amiga shell has got a full ANSI online terminal setup. So you can go in there and say, there, I'm in email. Now I just logged off the account, I'm back on the Amiga. 
So it's a full, and then I've got aliases for all sorts of things. I've got, if I do TDD, that's faster than typing delete. And I'm not going to do that by accident. It's three times. But delete deletes a file, right? I'm not going to find that file, but it deletes it. XXX just closes the shell. Fast ways to get things done. And you can define any number of these things. I didn't like the way that um, when I copy a file, you can just type copy file. But when you do, it changes the date and the time of the file. That drove me up the wall. I didn't change the file, I moved the file. You can type copy, file name, to, file name, clone, and that won't do it. It will keep the settings the way they are. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have to sit there and type um, that whole mess out every time. So if I, I forget and I do something, you know, which I didn't want to do, I've made it so it kicks that requester up to me and it says, idiot, don't do that, use CP instead. And CP... <laughs> CP is just an alias that that um, does a copy, but it sets the clone. It clones the, the copy. So right there it says CP is the equivalent of all of that. Again, you set this up once, don't worry about it again. Now all of a sudden your shell gets to be very fast. I mean, like for example, oops. I mean, I've got, I've got it when I need to set the stack up because I'm going to go use GhostScript and it demands a high stack. There, SS just set it to a megabyte because I've got a, a, a stack alias to set the stack to a megabyte, and there's some of them. Change task priority, execute, delete, copy, you know, and then for media players and, and all sorts of things. Debugging starts sashimi, end sashimi. Look at the logs that sashimi starts simple things. Um, uh, the other thing, which when I, I was saying about the copy, when I don't want to use the copy command, there's the command request choice, which actually brings up a file requester. So, I mean, you can come over here and say request choice, and then you have a title, body text goes here, okay. By typing in that simple length of, of string there, this is useful for scripts. If you're ever going to create a script, either in DOS or ARX or whatever, you have the ability to go and interact with the user on a GUI level. So, okay, great. I just told them a message. If you give it a number of buttons, it gives you a number for whatever they selected. It's an easy way for interacting without having to resort to just using a console. Um, another thing which I've done, because I have a bunch of different machines and a bunch of different drives and I'm constantly switching drives around and testing and beta testing this, that or the other thing, because of that I've taken the approach of saying, okay, I have this drive has got everything starts with an A on it, all the partition names, and I've got a post-it note on top of that hard drive that's got a big A written on it. <laughs> because I'm constantly swapping drives. I have a B drive and then S started with an S drive, so Seagate, a W drive for Western Digital, because that's what I had in my two machines. And I was constantly swapping them back and forth as I was testing things. So I'm like, oh damn, which one's the drive goes in the right machine? So I started doing this and I was putting that on there and I always have, you know, this is your system, there's a backup of the system, there's work, you know, all the apps, you know, data, media, junk, just crap that, you know, any, any scrap stuff goes there. So, but I didn't want to have to have it so that everything I ever do always relies on, oops, everything always relies on these hard-coded names. So the very first thing I do in the user startup is go define an assignment for every one of these drives that I use all the time, a common assignment. So we already know we have sys for the boot system, but I set work for where the apps are, I said data for A data, I said media for A media, junk for junk, A junk. Beauty is that all I have to do is just change these lines right there, five lines, and this drive can be moved to another system or I can boot off another, a second hard drive. This whole script, the rest of this whole area down here, the entire script, always refers to these assignments. 
So you can shuffle drives around by changing that one set of, and you don't have to mess with the entire rest of your user startup. Or for example, if you're in the, you know, your Amy doc, if you move Amy doc, if you get clicked in Amy doc, everything in Amy doc is using as the assignments. All of it's on the assignments so that, again, I can move the system and it's all based on an assignment, not a hard-coded drive name. <laughs> and that way, you move the system, I don't have, I lose a drive, I don't have to worry about it. I have a backup on another drive. I go change those five lines to the front, I have my entire system restored. Or I move from one machine to another, I change five lines, everything works. Um, so the, the assignments just go beyond just applications. They give you a, a way to give you uh, control, control your system and make it portable, just like Sys does for system. Um, so I talked about aliases. There are um, a few other tricks. Um, normally, like for example, if you come in here and you say, you okay, I'll use after a notepad. And now I've got the notepad and I can be typing away a notepad. But now I've locked up that shell and I can't use the shell anymore, right? Until I, until I quit notepad and get the shell back. But this is what I learned yesterday from Steven, and you probably know this from Unix. Then you could type that same thing, but put an ampersand at the end of it. I can go in here and be doing all of this. The ampersand spawned it off as a new task. It didn't lock up the shell. And uh, gives you, gives, lets you keep on going with whatever you're doing. Yeah. Um, another one is file name completion. I'm surprised more people don't use that. Um, but you have the ability to go and say, um, use file name completion for things that you're doing. If you're, obviously you can just hit tab and you, it completes the name on a unique string. But if you don't have a unique string or, or uh, for example, I go into um, internet, which I know has a whole bunch of redundant things in it, have a pop-up that gives you everything that has an O in it. And if I keep typing unique characters, W, now it's down to OWB. Fantastic way to get quickly through things. Um, yesterday when we were going through um, Val's system, you know, it was a way to get five levels deep by just typing two letters tab, two letters tab, two letters tab. And if you don't find something, you find something you don't remember, you just hit tab and it gives you the whole pop-up list of names. Um, the, in terms of uh, um, the startup script, like you have for the shell, you've also got it for, um, you've also got it for starting up your network. When your network starts, um, it, it runs a, a line that basically starts Roadshow, starts your network connection. Anything after that, once that connects, can be clients, can be cons anything you want to run, you can add to this script. And so, for example, if every time you turn on your computer, you always start up IRC and eyebrows and, and log into email, basically you can set all of that stuff in this script um, in the case, in the case of this computer, I have it turned off here, but basically I have it so when it, this computer is at home and I'm always on IRC and I'm on, uh, on, uh, have the web browser up and all that, every time I have it start, I have it ask me, do you want me to start internet applications? I use the request choice command, it asks me what I want to do and automate the applications. Um, I wrote a script that allows you to go and restore the sessions, for example, that you have in eyebrows. It runs in the background and it looks at the tabs you have open and then automatically if I want to open them all back up again, I just hit yes and it automatically, say Rex, sends eyebrows messages. Open up these tabs. There you go. I mean, oh, and there's the page with a bunch of these tips and tricks on there from Alex um, Carmona. So a lot of the things are all there different ways to go and run, run through and control your system. And we'll add these things to there so you guys will have that. Um, 
uh, the ability to get things done with AREX um, are, are immense still. It's a little 68K language, uh, yet you have the ability to write a script to do these things, or, or even simple things like open a page and another page. If I want to look at this page and open it in, in uh, Odyssey, I can, like for OWB, I just right click and it actually runs a script that copies OWB to RAM, so it's like runs quick and I don't have to worry about problems with it. It automatically loads the page in, uh, in OWB. Um, so if you want something fast, you use eyebrows and it loads everything nice and quick. And if you find something that's not compatible, you just right click and it's in there. Or right click, I can load it in Odyssey or I can use other scripts. Like for example, the ability to go and say, oh, well, I'm on, oops. Here's YouTube, nice and messy looking in eyebrows, but fast. And for example, there's uh, the stream here from here. If I want to go and find out how to get to the stream, Mick Treblecock wrote the, uh, the script called YT Rex, and you run the script, and there you go. There's the stream. Um, to Amy West. Actually, this isn't stream. It's a standing file. It looks like it. Oh, because Bill's gone. We're not streaming anymore. <laughs> so there it is. In, very quickly, this AREC script went off, found all the things, and um, if you want to, you can go and say, okay, play it in, uh, probably it's on this machine, I'm not sure if it'll play well, but what the heck, we're one reboot away. <laughs> so, um, right, did I even get it to take? What's that? There. there we go. So there's the actual URL. Unfortunately, this old version of, of um, M Player likes to pop up a lot of these requesters. The new version of M Player that Live for It's working on doesn't do that. But here we go with a video that's on YouTube. Um, it is. <laughs> and again, this is just A-Rex, just hacking into YouTube, finding it, and you have the ability to use this to um, uh, um, actually look at live TV if you want to. Sky News, for example, is on there. It streams Sky News to FF Play, and it just plays live news, and um, Again, just a rex hacking. It's an example of how far you can take it, which essentially was the point of the uh, um, the exercise. Um, so that's that's essentially the uh, the rundown, guys. So any questions? Any any? Have you guys got any hacks to add to the list? Old uh, OS 3.11 as a sub. Yeah. Can you install CD? Was that? Yeah. Can you install CD? Uh, somewhere. Alright, it's in um, NVARC uh, sys. It's so on the install CD, you can go to press slash n dash archive slash sys. Is it dat underscore ram? I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's one of those. Yeah. Just copy over to NVARC sys. So I can, we can either one get to Right. Okay. Yeah, well that or you might just find it, um, it might be, so in the RAM disk, that's actually a link, a soft link to your hard drive. It might be that your, your soft link has just been messed up. So what you need to do is, and I can't remember where it's set, well I'll check it again here, getting rid of that. I, the M player that runs on this machine is... Oh God, is it old? Is that the summer reloaded one? It's something like that. The guys that are right, when the they had this, yeah, there, there was this, there was this big push on to go and come up with a new up-to-date M player. The problem is they were optimizing it for Altavec and new machines, the so Radian HD machines, so you were able to play 720p video and all that, like we did at the banquet last night or in Trevor's presentation. They didn't update the old version. 
<laughs> so overlay is just dodgy as hell. Um, but yeah, if you go to, um, I mean, in the uh, in the uh, press directory, there are there are in environment archive and sys. There are a ton of icons. So right there, Def Ram. So and then where I think that gets set is in startup sequence. Uh, right there. See that? It's making a link from there to Def Ram, a soft link. And that essentially makes, so if everybody knows where the link is, it's like an alias in Mac OS. Basically, it's, it looks like a file, but it really is just a, a, a reflection of another file. And the soft link allows you to actually make that link um, to another drive in RAM. And so that way, if you go in there and you do anything to change this drive, this disk, like if I come over here and I snapshot it at this location, it's actually saving that snapshot that gets saved in that info file on this info file. So it's actually on your hard drive. So if you reboot, it's saved there because it's really looking at the one on the hard drive, not the one in RAM. Um, so aliases are, again, another nifty little trick of... Um, of uh, aliases, soft links. Links are a handy trick. Right. Well, and you might have. You either might have moved it, renamed it. Or maybe that line in the startup sequence isn't getting run, or something's happened to it. But those things are the things that move it in that direction. Um, aliases, I guess, are another thing, which would be another trick that you can play with the operating system that allow you to go and create. If you've got one file and you want to have it in a different place or you want to have access to it, you can use an alias um, to get to it. Or you can do an alias also for a directory. Um, one of the things which I did is Basically, because I don't like Big Brother and being watched, I created a, a script, of a rec script, that's debugging turned on there. But basically, it copies the entire contents that needs to be copied, and it makes soft links for the things that it can to everything in Odyssey, the web browser, in RAM. And I did the same thing. I did it originally with, um, with uh, OWB. And the main thing is because I'm just kind of like paranoid. I'm not paranoid. Paranoid. Probably paranoid. <laughs> it's like I just don't like Big Brother watching every time I do something. If I go search for taillights in Google, I really don't want Google showing me banner ads for taillights for the next three weeks. And I, if I go to my bank and then I go to, you know, wherever, Amazon afterwards, I really don't want Amazon looking at the cookies and browser history and whatever else they can weasel their way into to find out where it is my bank is. Um, so you put it in RAM, you do what you're going to do, you go, you know, to the permit office, get like, the status of a permit, and, oh, I don't have internet. Or do I? It's thinking about it. Anyway, uh, when I'm done, I quit that, and the script comes back to me and says, do you really want to copy something back? Like the bookmarks. I said, no. Do you want to erase it? Yes. Erases what's in RAM. It goes away. And I don't have, and if OWB or Odyssey crashes, as it wants to do, it doesn't matter. It didn't crash my computer my, on my hard drive. So it's in RAM, and it runs a little faster and all that good stuff. So it's another little trick. Um, so... Okay, guys. Any other thing else? I don't think so. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, guys.